Mm. So, good morning. Uh, I'm glad to be here again. And today we have another interesting topic. Uh, we're going to be continuing the topic of cross-selling, which we started last time. So, cross-selling, of course, this is when you offer another product or service to an existing client. Um, again, let me just repeat the repeat the obvious as a kind of basic summary. Uh, I think both of both of these they go hand in hand. Cross selling is when you offer something else to an existing client, another product or service, and upselling is when you offer a more premium product or service to an existing client. Um, needless to say. Cross-selling and upselling are very, very big opportunities for lawyers and partners and law firms. And to be honest, the most common situation that I see is that it's not happening or it's kind of happening on a sporadic basis. So it's really not that complicated. It's much easier than new client hunting. And this is what we're going to be looking at today. So again, we know about the early morning show. We have this every Thursday morning from 8.30 to 9.30. So the first 30 minutes is our lecture. And then the next 30 minutes, we have either Q&A, or sometimes I, I grab one of our kind participants and we do a little kind of interview. So a little bit later today, we have one of the colleagues in Croatia, and we're going to be talking with him about cross-selling as well. So 30 minutes, I'll try and, I'll try and stick to the 30 minutes of my lecture. Um, and then the, the interactive part at the end. And again, guys, I, I think you, you, you miss an opportunity because um, while you can't actually speak here because of the license, you can, and you're very welcome to throw questions or thoughts into the Q&A function at the bottom of the page or into chat. So, you know, don't, don't, don't be shy. <laughs> again, we have the, the 16 key concepts that we're going to be covering today. And if you, if you want a copy of the slides, you let me know. Um, the slides, they do have some advertising in them about Nikidonia services and products, such as our concept cards. Um, actually, I'm just thinking, mm, let me just go off on a random tangent. Yesterday, maybe some of you know about this, we did a live stream. This is a one-off live stream about legal writing on the rules of commerce. So I, I sent an email to everybody on the guest list. If you didn't manage to see it, um, I think it is worth you taking that hour and watching that live stream about the rule of commas. It's not modest of me to say because I'm the author and I, I wrote the content, but I think specifically the, the second half of that broadcast, when it gets a little bit more sophisticated and especially about clause diagrams, the pictographic representation of complicated sentences and the clauses and the commas and so on. I think that might be something that you don't know, perhaps, um, and it could be useful for you. So this is my little advertisement. Maybe take a note for yourself um, to well, subscribe to the Nihidonia YouTube channel. And on the Nihidonia YouTube channel, you can find the rules of commas. This isn't connected to business development, but I really think that it could be useful for us as lawyers. And of course, we have the previous topic, the 36 rules of writing, which is there as well. And uh, just before I come back to cross-selling, not Wednesday next week, but the Wednesday afterwards, um, I'm gonna do another live stream on legal writing, which is called the persuasive email. So this is gonna be a mixture of legal writing and sales writing. Um, I'm just going to do this as a Zoom, uh, as, as a YouTube live stream, because Zoom is really annoying me. We have problems with the license. So the link is already in YouTube. And if you go to LinkedIn, you can find the, the link there to for this legal writing topic the week after next. Okay, so coming back to, to cross-selling. Um, many lawyers, I think especially the younger lawyers, they're not really sure where to start on this kind of business development journey about how to improve their commercial skills, how to develop their commercial skills, what exactly to do. Um, 
And actually, I was just this morning speaking with the representatives from one Finnish law firm in Helsinki. I shouldn't mention their name because I, I didn't get permission. But what, what we're going to do with them is we're going to look at a number of their associates who have two or three years of experience. And the very first task in their journey is to simply make them aware that they shouldn't be good soldiers and to have a more customer centric perspective and to be asking the questions or identifying the opportunities about how we could further help uh, the clients. So this is kind of like pre-sales. And I think that in the same way that we're gonna develop these skills with the, with the younger lawyers, the associates, this is also a good thing to do for you uh, regardless of your position, even if you're a senior associate, a senior lawyer, even a partner, and you don't have a systematic approach to business development, then probably the best thing to do is to start with the current clients. And then after that, to go for the ex clients, and then after that, to go for the new clients. So I would call this one, then two, then four. We remember the one, two, four rule. Make life easy for yourself. Um, Sometimes taking these steps to becoming a little bit more commercial can be stepping out of the box and out of the comfort zone for, for lawyers. And that's fine. Even if, you're a, even if you're a partner, maybe you haven't done a lot of sales and business development before. Make life easy for yourself. Start with your current clients. And this would probably involve cross-selling. So um, you could have a... We, we know that the, there are three different names for this. Maybe the first month, you would do a market consolidation project. This would mean you're going to go out and have T for two and T for three with all of your current clients, especially your A clients, the clients that pay you the most revenue. We remember there is, um, we remember that there is a, um, how do we call it? We remember that, Sorry, I got distracted by the email. <laughs> um, we, we, we remember that there is a Pareto principle that perhaps 80% of your revenue is coming from 20% of your clients. So if you're beginning this journey, begin with your A clients. These good clients who pay you the most money, um, who do the most work with you, focus on consolidation. Then the next month, go for expansion. And then the next month, go for penetration. If you're a partner or a managing partner or a business development person, I think this kind of systematic desensitization over time with the lawyers is maybe the best way to go. I have seen many initiatives. Actually, to be honest, most initiatives that law firms start with business development fail. And the reason that they fail is uh, I think we're, we're setting too high expectations involving too many people, and it kind of dies a death because everybody knows the elephant in the room is billable hours and utilization. And so in some law firms, you just ignore these crazy, weird, extra business development things, and you get away with it. And then these initiatives kind of crash and peter out, and six months later, you realize nothing has happened or it stopped. So to avoid this, I would recommend taking a slightly longer term perspective over a number of weeks or months with this one, then two, then four approach. Consolidation, then to expansion, then to penetration. Again, if you're very keen and motivated, and I think you must be because you're on the early morning show, you would do this for yourself. You, know, you make it easy for yourself. It's going to give you some successes, some easy wins, some low-hanging fruit. And then you, you go further to the ex-clients and the new clients. Um, on the other hand, if you're a partner or a managing partner and you're managing a team, this is also probably the best, the best way to go. So start with the current clients, and that's going to be the cross-selling. Again, your metric of success, meetings. Doesn't matter how much time you spend on business development activities, you've got to get meetings. Um, and of course, cross-selling is a wonderful opportunity for you to recontact ex-clients. Um, for myself, maybe I, I'm doing business development every day. And, and so I can be a little bit cheeky. I can be a little bit shameless. I'm, I'm, this is really what I'm doing. I'm coming back to the different managing partners and partners that I was working with before Deloitte. So as you know, for the last three years, I was exclusively for Deloitte here in Prague. Uh, and so one of the things that I'm doing to, to get Nihidonia started and grow it again is recontacting the ex-clients. Now, it can be a little bit embarrassing 
It can be a little bit pushy. It can be a little bit uncomfortable for you to come back to an ex-client and say, hey, how are you doing? How's life? Let's have lunch. Because people are not silly. They understand, uh oh, this James person, he's probably going to sell something. Well, one way that you can do this to make it easier for yourself and for the client, use cross-selling as an initiative to recontact your ex-clients. And in fact, the advantage for you, and I think I'm just looking at the list of attendees, I think basically all of us are coming from full service law firms. The advantage for you is if you made a list of your ex-clients, so you should have this, I recommended this a few times, then you can make a list of your, your friends, your colleagues, and you can think what are the value propositions that they can actually offer. You will find there's probably more chance of finding an interesting bait, a reason to recontact that ex-client, not coming from you, but actually from one of your one of your friends. And I've said this before, it is generally much easier for you to say wonderful things about your colleague than it would be for you to say wonderful things about yourself. So um, I would recommend that we take the one, two, four approach to business development, slow and easy, beginning with the current clients, the next, then you. And especially when you're thinking about recontacting the ex-client, offer it as a T for three. So you say, hey, ex-client, how are things? I'd love to introduce you to my good colleague, so-and-so. Actually, I got some news for you. I started, um, uh, I started working with one of my friends because before the pandemic, we had, we had a number of clients, in, interestingly enough, in Central America and Latin America. And the wonderful thing is they all speak Spanish. So I have one of my friends, her name is Lucia. She's a lawyer and she's a Spanish speaker. So um, now she's Nichedonia. We have Lucia at Nichedonia.com. And so now it's very easy for me to recontact all of these different countries, the managing partners, and there's dozens of them in Spain and Latin America and saying, hey, we have this new capability with providing business development training and videos and solutions in Spanish. So, and the response rate is much, much higher. So think about recontacting clients with cross-selling. That could be a nice activity to do. Sometimes you can also have another opportunity. It's got a very tragic name. It's called orphaned clients. Now, uh, we understand that you have current clients, you have dormant clients, ex-clients, long ex-clients, and potential clients. So we know the one, two, four spectrum. We know the advanced one, two, four rule. An orphaned client, this means you have a client who suddenly loses their service provider. So let's imagine one of your friends, one of the lawyers or one of the partners leaves your company. Sometimes they might be taking some of the clients with them. You know, that inevitably happens. But sometimes there are some clients who end up being orphaned. They end up losing that lawyer. You need to have a very clear understanding of who is working with whom. And hopefully it's not an acrimonious divorce. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to communicate nicely and, and see which clients are gonna remain and, and be orphaned. And then you need to transfer them to another, another lawyer, which clients we can expect might, might, might go with that lawyer. The crazy thing is, and perhaps you won't be surprised about this, very often there is no systematic approach to dealing with orphaned clients. There is simply the assumption, the lawyer left, the clients are gone. You know, that's that's really silly. Uh, hopefully you had at least tried to be doing systematic cross-selling, especially with your A clients to retain the clients. Um, in that case, there's a chance that the orphaned clients could be retained. Um, but if not, then keep in mind that when people leave, that's an opportunity to recontact and cross-sell, if nothing else, to that, to that client. Um, let me go to the next slide. So we can develop the idea further. We have the one, two, four rule. We have these three categories and we can divide the three categories into clients A, B, or C. So your current clients, that's one. It takes you one hour to develop them. Of your current clients, divide them into A, B, C clients. The A clients is the 80% of revenue coming from 20% of the clients. These are the big clients, the ones that you really want to keep sweet. Then you have the B clients, the medium sized, and you have the C clients. Lots and lots of little itty bitty clients giving you mostly commodity work, mostly ad hoc, 
maybe it's even sometimes not just small companies, it might even be persons, which can be awful. <laughs> um, and of course, if you have declines, loss generators, you should be firing them or giving them away to one of your friends in another smaller legal practice. So we can, we can make these three lists of your current clients, A, B, and C clients. You can do the same with your X clients, A, B, and C clients. And you can do the same thing for your targets. You really should have a hit list probably industry-based, I would guess, of the big A clients you want to catch, then the B clients, and you might have some C clients. Strangely enough, um, especially if you're a partner or a managing partner, it could be a good idea to go after some small to medium-sized new clients like startups, small firms, because they can be doing interesting things. And because this can be a way for you to motivate your, your youngsters and the, the, the young lawyers. If you... If you get into, let's say, uh, health tech, you get into the health tech area. In your country, there's going to be not so many health tech companies, and the ones that exist are going to be quite quite small. But they will have young CEOs and general directors. They'll be dynamic, doing interesting things. So you should be aiming to get some uh, new clients, which are C clients, because it can be inspirational, motivational, and allow your younger lawyers to develop their skills. So once you have made this list of nine targets, so 1A, 1B, 1C, 2A, 2B, 2C, you, you would begin, of course, uh, you, you begin with the, the, the opportunity that's going to give you the most money and the best results quickly, 1A. You really need to go and have lunches with, it might be three or four people, go for these guys first, then you go for 1B, and then you decide if you're going to go for, for 1C or not, um, and then 2A, 2B, 2C, and so on. So, Keep in mind, most law firms have no time-based definition of their clients at all. Most law firms, I ask them, who are your clients? They just give me a list of names of everyone they've ever worked with. Current, dormant, X, long X, all dumped together. Very few law firms take this systematic approach of not just dividing into three target groups, current, X, and new, but also segmentation, A, B, and C. So that's an activity that you can, that you can do. Another activity is something which I call coin analysis. Um, this might be new for you, unless you've done some training with me before. This is an individual activity. So I think this is good for you guys because you're, you're on the broadcast here. It means you're keen on business development. So you can do this yourself. You don't have to do this with anybody else in your law firm. Um, boom, boom. You have two types of clients. Transactional clients, they come to your law firm, they do their thing and they're gone. And you have relationship clients. They come to your law firm and they stay for years and years. Um, it's really good to be able to change your transactional clients into relationship clients. If a transactional client comes to you, they pay you one golden coin and they're gone. A relationship client, even if it's a small coin, that revenue stream those list of coins going off into the future can be quite significant and it's very good for cash flow. So we can think that um, your client can be represented by a coin. Now, if you look at your, let's look at one of your current clients or a recent ex client, uh, you can look at them in terms of development, looking to the future and looking to the past. So you make a list of your, let's say your current clients five or six of them. And you make a list of past opportunities and you make a list of future opportunities. So the coin has two sides. That coin represents the money you got just now, but we can get more coins in the past and we can get more coins in the future. Then what do you do? Then you brainstorm. With that client, you ask yourself, what else could we do with them? So regarding past opportunities, if you've done a due diligence, you've, you've gotten an understanding of the client, you might see some skeletons in the closet, there's probably some different opportunities for cross-selling or upselling or reselling. So you brainstorm on what I understand from what we've already done with that client, what else could we offer them? Anything at all. And then uh, the second column, you brainstorm, what else could we do with them looking to the future? You could be market driven if there's going to be changes in legislation in your country or in the European Union level, or you could be uh, client driven. You know that they're going to open a facility, they're going to do a merger, they have some plans or goals or ambitions for the future. So you brainstorm, how could we help them in the future? 
So you have this list of your five or six current clients. You have the past opportunities and the future opportunities and you brainstorm and you see how can we help them. You're going to realize you don't know your clients as well as you thought you did. So uh, a, a number of the boxes in this table will be blank. So what do you do? You should invite your client for lunch, for tea, get to know them, ask them questions, understand better the past and the future opportunities. However, when you do this activity, you will discover some hidden gems. You will have a moment of epiphany, a realization. You will think, oh my goodness, yes. You know, there is that opportunity, maybe with competition and antitrust, I could introduce this colleague. Or, oh yes, there's this opportunity that I can propose my services for this future potential activity. So while you do coin analysis as a systematic brainstorming activity, and this might take you, depending on how deeply you wanna do it, might take you just, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, most of it will be disappointing. You will find one or two or three hidden gems and then you pitch. And your pitch, it might be an AIDA pitch in sales writing. It might be a warm call. It might be an invitation to lunch. In fact, probably the best type of um, step would be then after you've done coin analysis, you find the hidden gem, then you go for T for two or T for three. Okay, so that's a nice activity you can do yourself. And again, guys, let's let's take a step back. And I, I keep hearing this from lawyers. Sometimes they tell it to me. They say it's unethical to sell, James. We shouldn't be proposing things to our clients. We're, we're, we're these very clever lawyers. We, we're sitting in an ivory tower. People come to us, they ask us questions, and we give them answers. That's really, really bad. Uh, I wouldn't agree with this. So if you, in your team, you encounter some lawyers who are saying, it's not my job to sell, it's unethical to sell, uh, you tell them they're wrong. <laughs> you tell them they're absolutely wrong. It is unethical to push something to somebody who doesn't need it, of course. So sales can be unethical. In legal sales, it's about you understanding the needs of your clients. You have to ask them open questions. The client themselves might not realize they have some needs. And it would be unethical for you not to do this because if you don't identify the needs and the opportunities to help the client, the client doesn't realize this, they go ahead and they get, they get sued, they get into litigation, they get fined, they miss opportunities. So if someone says to you, we don't sell, we're lawyers, uh, you can tell them that's very unethical. That is, that is very unprofessional. It, you, it's part of your job. You're like a doctor like a doctor with a patient, you can't simply do what patients tell you because the patient might have symptoms, might not even have symptoms. It's your job, it's your obligation as a doctor to do a diagnosis and then to recommend the best course of action for the, for the patient. It would be criminally negligent if you didn't do that or if you just did what your patient told you. So um, it's unethical to sell, is wrong. And especially regarding cross-selling, there are existing opportunities Inevitably, I can guarantee you with your top five clients, your top five clients really do have cross sell opportunities. You don't know about it because you're probably not as close to your clients as you could be. Take them to lunch, ask them, op ask them open questions, identify these opportunities to help them. And then it's unethical and unprofessional if you don't do this. So you can see I'm a little bit um, provocative with this. A nice way, by the way, guys, a nice way to, to cross sell is a very kind of English approach. I got this from law, from law firms in London. Just at the end of a client consultation, just at the end of a, a client meeting or a lunch, you can say, oh, by the way, let me introduce you to my good friend, Susan. She, she does such and such. So the, this, this approach is good because it prevents you from forgetting to cross sell. When you're at a client meeting, you're standing up, you shake hands, you're heading for the door, they're relaxed, they think the consultation is over, and this doesn't look like selling. Um, the best selling doesn't look like selling. And you say, oh, by the way, and there's a very good chance that they say, okay, sure. I would say there's more than a 50% chance that they would say, okay, sure. You suggest a concrete person, you suggest T for three, and there's some kind of value proposition, which you need to be able to describe in one sentence. So take the oh, by the way, approach for cross-selling. It's very, it's very nice. It's very easy. It's easy for you uh, and it's easy for them and it has a high conversion. When you're thinking though about cross-selling, another activity you can do is called PIP cross-selling. We can cross-sell 
practice by practice. So you can make a list of your lawyers and then you can make a list of the other the, the practices and identify, OK, um, with these clients, we can offer competition. We can do corporate. We can do tax. That's fine. You can also think of cross-selling by industry. You know, for these legal products or solutions, these memoranda, which we can recycle from previous work in this industry, let's try and propose it for this related industry. So we've done something. I did this in, okay, I shouldn't mention the company. I did this with one large international law firm. We had quite a nice practice with pharma. And then we decided to go into biotech. Uh, unsurprisingly, there's a very big crossover between pharma and biotech. We would just need to tweak the value propositions a little bit and, and pitch them. And even product uh, cross-selling. You can look at uh, not just industries, but products uh, or services that are being produced and the, the work that we did with them, and then how we can cross-sell there. So three different approaches to cross-selling, practice-based cross-selling, industry-based cross-selling, and product-based cross-selling. Um, I think they get harder. Practice is easier than industry, and industry is easier than, than product. And again, most law firms don't actually have well-defined products, so that's something you can, you can work on. And again, keep in mind, when you're suggesting a cross-sell, it's not, can you do me a favor? let me introduce my good colleague. She wants to sell you something. No. Can I do you a favor? I want to introduce you to my wonderfully talented colleague. She does these awesome things. You change your mentality in the same way that you mustn't think it's unethical to sell. You need to understand it's unethical not to sell. It's unethical not to identify needs and then to try and satisfy them. You need to change your mentality here. You're not asking for a favor in order to introduce one of your colleagues. You have highly talented, wonderfully qualified um, colleagues. They know some good stuff. These are valuable. Can I do you a favor? I want to help you. Believe me, if I was your client, I'm a Scottish businessman, and you're working with me in one area of law, and you suggest, hey, James, let's go and, let's go and have a, a coffee. I want to introduce you to my friend from banking and finance. Cool. I'm interested. You know, maybe they can tell me about loans or mortgages or credits. Maybe they, they can tell me about a bank accounts or green funding or bonds. Or I would have curiosity. You know, your, your clients would be grateful. They should be grateful to be introduced to your colleagues. So keep in mind that offering a T for three is actually a very nice thing for you to be doing. It's, it's your, you're doing a favor. And one mistake to avoid in cross-selling, and I, I think I might upset one or two of the colleagues on the list here because I, I see their names. Sometimes in law firms, there's the idea of cross-selling. How can we make it happen? Let's do speed dating. So we'll get a bunch of lawyers and we're going to let them all run around, give them five minutes each to introduce themselves to the other lawyers and tell them what they do and what. Um, and sometimes managing partners get invited to events like this. I, I really mustn't mention <laughs> names, but there was an event in, I'm not even going to mention the city. There was an event in one Western European capital where a um, managing partner was invited to this event and to pay good money for it. And the managing partner meets other managing partners of the other law firms. They do the speed dating, comes back with a handful of business cards, 10 or 20 different business cards. And that's considered to be a good thing. No, waste of time, really. What's the follow up going to come from this? Maybe I'm being a little bit opinionated, but my expectation is nothing is going to come from this. Yes, you can add them as LinkedIn connections. And yes, you have them as business cards. And maybe one day if you have a legal request uh, for something in, in, I don't know, Tunisia, then you'll know your man in Tunisia. It wouldn't be that difficult to find your person in Tunisia by opening Legal 500, however. So I think speed dating activities, that's generally a cross-selling mistake. The problem isn't about introductions and knowing the other people, uh, although it can help, of course, to understand if they have good value propositions and products, that's not bad. But without the follow-up to get the meetings, nothing's going to happen. So don't expect other people to be selling you. Don't have that wishful thinking mistake. Don't be preaching to the converted, showing everyone your good legal capability, because no one was doubting that in the first place. Whatever you're going to do, if you're going to do cross-selling initiatives inside your company, don't make the speed dating mistake. Understand your metric of success is meetings. You've got to get meetings. And of course, best salesman never sounds like a salesman. That's why I like the oh, by the way approach. 
doesn't sound like selling. That's why the best selling, the best cross-selling, when you have a T for two with your client, selling isn't telling. You should be using consultative selling. Mm, I think in the summer, it's one of the topics which we will do for four weeks in the early morning show. Mm, but it means you, you, the best way to sell is by asking questions not by telling. So this stereotype on television about the car salesman, this pushy sales, totally, totally wrong. The best, okay, I shouldn't be sexist. The best salesperson never sounds like a salesperson. If you sound like you're selling, you're doing it wrong. Um, and again, another mistake in your law firm, like with the internationals, what have I typically seen? The typical law firm has one client in one jurisdiction, working in one practice group with one lawyer. That's catastrophic. I call this the four ones mistake. So if you're part of a legal network or if you're present in several jurisdictions, uh, I would expect you're probably making this mistake. You have this single, single line, this very thin thread connecting you to the client. One client, one jurisdiction, one practice, one person. Uh, and if that's good revenue, let's say it's coming from corporate M&A, from some big dispute, it's a catastrophic and very foolish mistake not to be cross-selling. So you can do a one 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 analysis and identify which of these clients are with very tenuous connection to your firm, or if, if it's just on, on you yourself, it would be in your interest to actually introduce one or two of your friends to strengthen the relation. It would strengthen your relation if you cross-sell to others in your, in your practice. One way to do this, one way to identify the needs is to do a thing called client bonds analysis. Um, what you do here is you choose one single client, one of your A clients. You cannot answer the question, how good is your relationship on a scale of one to 10? Because you have different types of relationship with that single client. You have bureaucratic, you have organizational, you have need, you have direction in terms of your culture and you have social. So we can split the layers of relationship to our current client across five parameters. And um, you make a star diagram. So this is why you have the pentagram. If you have level zero relationships in terms of bureaucracy, in terms of the paperwork and the contracts, in terms of the organizational correct connection, in terms of the, per the perception of need, if you have zero for all of them, it would just be a point. And if you had 10 for all of them, it would be a full pentagram, a pentagon. <laughs> uh, and so what you do is you do this client bonds analysis and you have the different levels on the, on the pentagon for that client. Um, I have a paper about this. Actually, it's an entire four hour training. So it can become quite sophisticated, but you could do this yourself. Uh, so basically you're identifying what are the opportunities to improve the relationship, the current client relationship. Actually, this is what I'm gonna be doing with those Finnish lawyers about well, current client satisfaction. How can we strengthen the current relations with the, with the client? Probably one of the big ones is about social connection. You, have you had a coffee with them? Do you know when is their birthday? Are you connected on, on Facebook? Uh, do you understand their hobbies? You know, probably you can be socially closer to your clients. It's a terrible situation, but in many law firms, the lawyers don't even know who the clients are. If you don't know who the client is, I don't see how you can improve the relations with them. So that's kind of pity. And my advice would be, yes, you should be closer to your clients. You should be Facebook friends with your clients. Your problem isn't that you're too close to your clients. Your problem is probably you have very little, if any, connection to your client. There is a huge overlap, especially at the senior level, between social and business. Um, one of the managing partners here in Prague upset a lot of his partners by explaining this to them. Another managing partner who I think is awesome in business development. I think some of the colleagues on the call will guess who I'm talking about uh, in Frankfurt. Uh, he also was explaining this, that when you're at that level, at the managing partner level with your A clients, you will be much, much closer. You will be having the dinners. You will introduce your spouse. You might go on a holiday together. Um, you, the more senior you are and the more valuable the relationship, the closer you're going to be. Uh, I found this out by accident a few times that sometimes I became Facebook friends with different partners, managing partners before the pandemic. I didn't do it in any kind of systematic Machiavellian way. I just did it because it was fun. And I realized that sometimes we're chatting. We still have this relationship. And in the end, it did result in some mandates as well. I wasn't even trying <laughs> to do that. So, yes, be close to your clients. 
And then the last concept for today, because we've gone over time and I want to uh, do the Q&A and then speak with one of the colleagues from Croatia. Um, a recent discovery that I've, I've come across in the last few weeks, we know about cross-selling, we know about upselling, we know about reselling, we know about downselling, um, deep selling. I came across this by accident. And this is a recent development in the financial services industry in the 2020s. And what is deep selling? That's the question I asked myself. Well, deep selling, if you remember the iceberg model, Deep selling is where you're not specifically cross-selling, where you create a product and then you, you pitch it to people. Um, deep selling is when you, you use, um, well, it could be with AI. Uh, it, it could be, it, again, your, your law firm maybe isn't at that level of sophistication, but it means that we identify likely needs for similar clients. We do an analysis. So if you uh, are dealing with startups, we can predict that some of the startups, when they move to a larger stage of development, are going to need certain products and solutions. And then we talked about this the last time, the life cycle. And then when we, they move from smaller firm to medium firm, medium to larger, there's going to be predictable cross-sell opportunities. We haven't probably done this analysis. So with, with deep selling, it's not simply that we create legal products and we pitch them based on expectation, that would be proactive cross-sell pitching. With deep selling, it means we really do an analysis of similar clients or that client themselves to identify potential needs and then make them aware that these solutions exist. So for example, with Airbnb, they use um, AI and they do deep selling. They use AI, they gather the information on their their clients who are going to use the, the Airbnb. And then if they see that someone is a couple, they might pr propose romantic restaurants. They might propose different kind of tours. They might propose different types of venue for the next trip based on that kind of socio-demographic status. Um, and they can, you, the better you understand your client, you can then begin to see which kind of products or solutions are more likely to be sold. Again, if you're dealing with Airbnb and it's um, single people, or small families, small families, as, as they get older, the kids move away from being tiny, they become teenagers, you would be able to develop the products and solutions with your ongoing analysis and your AI to be able to make them aware on your, on your client portal about different things that you could offer. So deep selling is a more kind of analytical approach to products and solutions likely to be needed. And then it oversteps into the area of cross-sell and upsell. So I'm, I'm in the process of, of, of thinking, how can we actually get into deep selling uh, for the legal services industry? So I have a few ideas. Um, that's that's going to be a, a future topic of training, I expect. I think it's quite, it's quite fun. We don't need to use AI and very sophisticated technical solutions to do this either, <clears throat> to be honest. So that's, that's about deep selling, something on the horizon, a new development in business development that you can be aware of and then eventually be able to do. That's enough for today regarding the lecture part um, because it's already coming up for 10 past. So we have still 20 more minutes for the Q&A and uh, one of the colleagues should be joining us. I don't know if he's already here. I'll be asking some questions. In any case, uh, you can see my schedule for the for March and April and May. Um, and if I'm in your cities, then you can you can meet me again if you want the, the pitch, the presentation, there's the, the adverts on it or the different services.